He's not familiar with the Melchizedek priesthood? No. Yeah, many people are not familiar with that one. That one takes a lot of, uh, that one might take some, some like, serious, serious stuff right there. Like, I mean, I was just listening to him for the most part, but I mean, like, one of the things he said, it didn't make sense. He said, because he believes that all the Israelites are going to get powers. Well, I think he got a point that all of us are going to be sitting on top. But, uh, but no, I'm talking about he thinks that pretty much everybody's going to be like the same. All Christians or all believers. Yeah. So I'm like, so what's the significance of like he believes that what he what he said was everybody is gonna have the same, is gonna be, you know, have the same gift or same whatever. So, but I asked him, I said, then what's the point of following the commandments? I mean, because uh, I'm under the impression that the award, the rewards would be different from following the commandments based on somebody that's having a salvation. And he he really couldn't explain that. Yeah. You know, but I mean he, I mean he's good people. I mean, I to tell you the truth, it's, it's you and him are the only two I listen to at this point. Yeah. You know, uh you don't want to judge the other people's opinions. Oh no, not at all. But, uh, not at all. I'm not saying you were doing that or anything, but uh Sometimes we gotta, you know, sometimes we listen what other people believe. I listen to a lot of Hebrew Israelites and they believe a little different on certain things, but I still listen to them. Cause they might have a point or two that's really will blow you out of the water, you know? Yeah. So I listen he, to them. He doesn't really mess with the camps too much. Well, yeah, not camps are not exactly for everybody. Not exactly for everybody. You know, if God calls you to a camp, that's pretty good. You go in there and, and that iron sharpen iron. Let them show you what they believe, especially if God has guided you that, that direction. It's really him that's doing it. But if God has not guided you toward a camp, then you might want to stick with uh, who he's uh, allowed to teach you or whatever, you know. I want to stick there, stay in, stay put, stay where you're at, you know? Yeah. But praise y'all. We're back again. This is another Shabbat. All right. I think uh, tomorrow is the new moon day, if I'm not wrong. Tomorrow, tomorrow is new moon day. So our Sabbaths are going to be on, on this Saturday for the next four weeks. Next four weeks after this. And we'll be right along with everybody else that does Friday sundown, Saturday sundown. You know, Abdul Alton spoke about that on regular videos, on normal videos, about uh, the uh, Hillel too that, that was in Rome that worked with the Roman Empire that got our Sabbaths changed to being on their Gregorian calendar. All right. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think y'all is going to judge everybody uh, like that if they didn't keep try to keep a Sabbath. Everybody has their different beliefs, you know, about when the Sabbath is. And then everybody should be fully convinced in their own heart and mind, like the scripture says. All right. Uh, but uh, just like the Melchizedek priesthood, not everybody understands that. But it's a process, you know. It's a process of understanding that, understanding the law. That that law is really the toughest thing to understand, because Yah did that with Paul on purpose. He uh, he allowed some of that what Paul wrote to seem very confusing, and it's like a parable. And uh, his disciples asked asked him when he was preaching, "Ask how was I? Why do you speak to the people in parables?" You know, he told him, he said, because not everybody is not meant for everybody to, to understand. And uh, he tells us in another place 
Don't give that which is holy unto the dogs, or cast out pearls before the swine, lest they, lest they trample them under their feet and turn around and tear you to pieces. You feel, you start feeling ripped off being around people like that. All right? So that means that the devil, uh, one of his tricks was, was to get 5,000, 10,000 people to follow Yahweh Shai, you know, out there in the desert regions. And a lot of them, most of them, believe it or not, were not right. And uh, sometimes the devil will do that. He'll have you get famous to try to overthrow you. You know what I'm saying? And he did that with Yahweh Shai. He, tried, he got Yahweh Shai famous to try to overthrow him. He was literally famous. That's why when people say he was a man despised and forsaken and we hid as it were our faces from him and all of that, in that scripture in Isaiah 53, it really proves that there's something going on, something else going on there about the, what, what it spoke about Yahweh Shai, despised, forsaken. And, and we hid as it were our faces from him and we did not esteem him. He was despised and we esteemed him not and all of that. You know, what part of the scripture, what part of his life was like that? Because his own mother and father can get to him in one of the places he was in, you know. His own, what is it, brothers, sisters, mothers and fathers. He was in a house preaching and they wanted to see him. And he said, my mother and brother are those that hear the word of God and do it. Basically, it didn't say that he went out there to them. It did not say that. Did not say he went out there to figure out, try to figure out what was going on. Now, maybe he did. The scripture don't say that. The scripture just says, you know, who are my mother, brothers, and sisters? Those that hear the word of God. And he looked around about them and said, those that hear the word of God and do it. So it's like his, his own mother and brothers and them that were seeking him weren't obeying. And uh, he basically was not drawing close to them. And now uh, we know that in the scriptures that Mary, his mother, had a problem with it for a while, with what he was talking about. And so you can see why she was outside the house and not sitting there with him. She had a problem with it. You know, people don't talk about that that much. But by the end of his ministry, she was with him. She was right there with him. She believed, she became a believer. As well as, you know, his brothers did not believe either. So you can see why they was outside the house wanting to see him. And, and it, comes out, it comes right after he was uh, doing something, preaching about who he was. And, and it says that his friends heard what he was doing and said that he had lost his mind. He had lost his mind. So basically, he had, he, there were some things he wasn't talking like at first. Then all of a sudden, he started really uh, explaining who he was. What his, what his purpose was. And they basically, when it says his friends, you know, the next thing, the next verse of scripture, you see that his father, his mother and brothers and sisters were out there wanting to see him. Basically saying, you know, uh, I think we need to talk to you. You know, are you losing your mind? Why are you saying all of these things? Don't you know that them people will kill you? Let me see if I can find this real quick. See if I can find it real quick. Let's see, hold on just a moment. But you can tell that's the reason why they were there. See, I hope I put in the right thing to get it up here. Yeah. Let's see. Let's go to Luke. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8.
See, I got that scripture, Luke 8, 21. Let me see if I can find a place where it says he has lost his mind. All right, let's see. Hold on just a moment. So, you know, people ever said something like this about you for trying to obey God. Uh, know that definitely they did that to your house, you. Let's, let's try this. Beside himself, which basically means he's lost his mind. There it is, Mark, Mark 321. When his friends, when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay, to lay hold on him, but they said he is beside himself. All right, let's see, Greek 1839, go beside himself. Uh, that means, let's see, the word is estimi, existimi, existimi. It means to put or stand out of wits. That is astound or reflexive, astound or become astounded, insane. So they were literally saying that he's not, he's not right. He's insane. Let's see, insane. Uh, astonished, beside it, beside stuff, bewitch, he's in wonder. So they was basically saying that he was not right. All right, so his friends heard it, they, they want to lay hold on him. So what can we see where they want to lay hold on him at? Let's go back to Luke. What we just at? Luke 8, 21. And he answered, let's see, Luke 8, 20, let's try that. And it was told him by a certain which said, thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to see thee. And he answered and said unto them, my mother and my brethren are these, are these which hear the word of God and do it. So he was talking about the people that was with him in the house. He said, are these which hear the word of God and do it. So they weren't hearing it and they weren't doing it. That's what he was saying. They didn't understand what he was talking about. They said to themselves, he, he was out of, beside himself, he was insane. So you can see why his, his brothers apparently didn't believe. And they thought he was really all. His mother was one of those until a certain period of time in his ministry and she, and then she became a believer before his death. And when he rose again, she was right there. She was a believer already. She was at his cross, Mary Magdalene and her, another Mary. Uh, but, um, <clears throat> but there's some things sometimes you believe that are really true, that people will believe that you've lost your mind, you know? But yeah, how wish I went through that himself. But um, but yeah, the Melchizedek understanding of scripture is a little is it is is you know like if you play in a video game and you go to you, you start on level one, it's a it's a slow level, and uh, you get used to that level, and then you go to uh, level two, so it, it's a faster level. Finally, you get used to that go to level three, which is one of the hardest levels. And uh, that's how these, these uh, doctrines really are, at different levels. Um, when you grow up in doctrinal understanding, it's not just doctrinal understanding, it's spiritual understanding. But that's the reason why reading the scriptures, studying, praying, and walking in these scriptures keeping them as best as you can, constantly listening to the scriptures, not only reading it, but listening. I listen to a lot of videos all the time. 
to see what these Hebrew Israelites are talking about. And uh, that will help you grow. But I, I do not, it doesn't astound me or amaze me that somebody like him uh, would not understand the Mechizedek. Because it's, it's only understood by certain people. You know, it's a certain level of growth. As a matter of fact, from what I understand about the Mechizedek teaching, uh, it's, it's a sign of the kingdom. Because Melchi means king or royal, and Zedek means uh, righteous. So righteous means like a priest. And that's what Yah wanted us to be in the very beginning, a kingdom of priests. All right? So he wants us with the Melchizedek understanding of the scriptures. But it's very hard. There's so many Bible teachers out there that, is, that have points. And uh, everybody does, when they see Melchizedek in it, they say, yeah, Melchizedek met Abraham on the way back from the slaughter of those kings. And, uh, but as far as understanding how Yahawashai is a Melchizedek high priest, uh, they only have a little bit of understanding and knowledge about it. All right. But Melchizedek, the Melchizedek priesthood was around um, was around uh, before Yahawashai definitely got here. And it was around before the Aaronic priesthood. So when Yah delivered Israel out of Egypt, the Melchizedek priesthood, excuse me, the Melchizedek priesthood is what he got him out of Egypt with. All right, so there was no Aaronic priesthood until the transgression. All right. There was no Aaronic priesthood until they sinned by worshiping the golden calf. Then the covenant, which was under the uh, Melchizedek priesthood, was put on hold until he would come that would take away that transgression. That was Yahweh Shai. So when it was put on hold, we were put under the law. All right? We were put under the law, not a covenant. Law for transgressions. All right? Because those that sin had to be dealt with. So that's the reason why uh, Israel was uh, was was keep was wearing fringes and certain things until that time came. But Yah done it in such a way that no matter what level you're on, if you sincerely walking these steps, he received he receives you. So that means even if you're wearing fringes and, and uh, you're not at that level of Melchizedek, even if you're wearing fringes, you're not at Melchizedek level yet, and you're sincerely right there and you're wearing fringes, Yah's gonna, not going to say, why are you wearing fringes? And you know that's over with? You're not going to say that. You're going to say, well, well done, my good and faithful servant. You know? He's going to say, well done. Because they've done the best that they could do. That's where they were at. All right? And really, wearing fringes is a good level. That's letting you know that you're returning. You know who you are. You're returning to the covenant. All right? And God likes that. From there, you grow. All right? I see a lot of Hebrews. I got a video on right now where a bunch of brothers are wearing fringes. I saw a video where there was some that was wearing fringes. There was some that was not. They had, they had different stuff for whatever reason. It was two groups together, and um, but they were still together and preaching and hollering out and chanting and I wouldn't say chanting. I don't want to make it look bad, but they were proclaiming his law, his word, like a trumpet, lifting up their voice like a trumpet. So some had fringes on, some didn't. Somebody asked me why I'm not wearing fringes and know that I'm a Hebrew Israelite. I tell them, you know, I tell them that. That I'm not at that level, you know. And sometimes you might have to say it in such a way to where other people might get offended, you know, that I've crossed that border, you know. Uh, let me see if I can find that scripture where it says the law was given, the law of Moses, the law of Aaron, excuse me, was given 
because of transgressions. Verse. Let's see if I can find it. It's in the New Testament. Paul knew what he was talking about. But Paul is easy to misunderstand too. There it is. Galatians three nineteen. Wherefore then serveth the law? All right. Wherefore Galatians three nineteen. The first part of it says. Wherefore then serveth the law? Let me highlight it. Wherefore then serveth the law? What he's talking about was the law that was added because of transgressions right here. It was added because of transgressions. And some people think they put, when they see uh, Exodus, 19 through 24, they see that just as a just as another part. They don't understand it. That the coming to Mount Sinai and the covenant and the, the covenant being signed between Yah and his people, they don't see that as being just the covenant, not the law. That was commandments in that covenant, but it was not the law. It was a it was a covenant. And they 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 put it all together in one lump. And call it all the law. But that's not the case. The law was what was added because of transgression. So it comes after the covenant. So when you see, uh, let me go here real quick. When you see Exodus chapter 24, after God come down, his, he was standing on the stone. Let's see. Exodus 24. Let's see. And they saw the God of Israel. Let me go here real quick, Exodus 24. Then went up Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel, and they saw Exodus 24. Let me highlight this. And they saw the God of Israel. See that? This is before the law because of transgression. So they were still under Melchizedek. And Melchizedek priesthood, they, they had not sinned yet with the golden calf. So they saw the God of Israel that was under his feet as it were a paved work of a sapphire stone as the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also they saw the God, they saw God. See, also they saw God. It didn't say they saw something. Literally, this is God, the Most High. They saw God and did eat and drink. All right. So that's the biggie right there. They saw God and did eat and drink. So this is the covenant. When they made the covenant, it's a marriage. All right. So at the marriage, God showed up. And it says they saw God. It didn't say they perceived that they, that they had saw God. It didn't say that. It says they saw. Let me look at this. Hebrews 27, 23, 72. The word saw. Kazal is the word to gaze at. And it does say right here, <clears throat> mentally to perceive, to contemplate with pleasure. So they, they gazed at him. And they mentally perceived and contemplated with pleasure. I mean, they were glad to see it because all uh, specifically to have a vision of, it says a vision, behold, to look, prophesy, provide, to see. So they saw God and did eat and drink. So basically, it was like a, you know, at weddings, when you have a wedding ceremony, and then after the wedding ceremony, you have a, uh, what is it called? Uh, that they do after a wedding, 
uh, like a celebration. All right, and then when they celebrate, they eat and drink. And that's what happened here. All right, so the God of Israel was, was with the Mechizedek covenant. But what happened was yeah. they broke the covenant and God gave him some more commandments and laws. All right. So it was like they were under probation. They got into trouble with Yah. Yah had to put them in a certain position to where he would not destroy them. It's in history. Let's go back to where we were just at. Galatians 3 19. Wherefore then serveth the law. It was added because of transgressions. So it was added right here, added. So the law was really added. So what was it added to? What was the law added to? That word for added, 40 Greek, 43, 69. Let's look at that. Posti, uh, postith ami. I posted them in 4369 in the, in the Greek to place additionally that he has laid beside to, to lay the law a book beside that which was already given, I guess. To repeat, to add again, to add again, give more, increase, lay unto, proceed further, speak to. So basically, it's saying that what we think it's said to add to some. So it was added because of transgressions until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. So it was added because of transgressions until Christ would come. To the, to the seed would come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained in, in, by angels in the hand of a mediator. All right. So the law was added. So we have to understand sometimes when Paul is talking about the law, we have to understand sometimes we might be talking about that which was added. So part of the law that was added, and I use, um, I'm gonna use fringes as an example. And I'm not telling anybody to stop wearing fringes. If you still have fringes, wear your fringes. But uh, in the book of Numbers, this is part of what was added. Numbers 15, let's see here. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Numbers 15, 37, speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations. So that means even now. So when we see these brothers wearing fringes, are they wrong? No. It says throughout their generations. And that they put up on the fringe of the borders of ribbon of blue. So somebody might say, well, put them on, brother. Put them on. Why you ain't got them on? Here's the reason. And it shall be unto you for a friend that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of Yahweh and do them. All right, brother, see that? It helps you do those. Watch this. Uh, and that you seek not after your own heart and your own eyes after which you used to go a whoring. All right, now here's the problem right here. Now we did go a whoring. What did we do? We committed adultery against Yahweh at the Mount Sinai. When Moses was up there for a little longer than what we thought he should have been. And we had some people that, that basically said, hey, let's go back to Egypt. Here, Aaron, make us a golden calf and if that may lead us back to Egypt. Because as for this Moses, we don't know what's going on with him. So what happened was they committed adultery, spiritual adultery against Yahweh after making the covenant. Because they, now they were married to Yahweh. Then all of a sudden they committed adultery. All right. How did they commit adultery? Because they worshiped the golden calf after they just married Yahweh. So the golden calf, now they start fornicating, committing adultery with the golden calf, spiritually. Not physically, but spiritually. All right. So Yah saw Israel as a woman that, that commits adultery, that committed adultery against. Them. And that's called going a whoring. Let's look at this word whoring, Hebrews 21, 81. Let's see.
Zana uh, Ali Thin, therefore wanton. That word is like lusty, wanton, to commit adultery. Because usually of the female and less often of the simple fornication, of simple fornication, rarely of involuntary ravishment. Regularly to commit adult idolatry. That's what they did. We committed adult idolatry at Mount Sinai. All right. So what happened? We were the word, we were the word of fringes all those years until Christ came to remind us to not seek after our own heart and our own eyes, after which we used to go a horn, after we committed adultery, how, which is how we committed adultery at Mount Sinai. It was whoring. All right. So what happens, you, you wear the fringes until you come to Christ, not just come to become a believer and then just like the white man and all of these other Christians are saying, hey, you don't have to do any commandments any longer because Christ came and done them for you. That's not what he's talking about. Here. That means you still put, you still wear the fringes because Israel, after Christ, after Yahweh Shai had risen and, and went back to heaven, was still doing sacrifices, animal sacrifices, uh, the disciples, we don't know whether they was wearing fringes or hymns or anything, but they should have come to that point. But Israel was still at the temple, went on with the animal sacrifices, the day of atonement. Even Paul uh, had a, had a uh, what is it called? A Nazarite vow. All right, Paul had a Nazarite vow. Let me see if I can find that. Watch this. Hold on just a moment. I hope I'm spelling Nazarite correctly. So Paul was preaching and was a believer and he had a Nazarite vow. Let's see. Uh, trying to find it. I know it's in the book of Acts. Okay, here we are, Acts 21. If I would have searched it out on my own, I would have went, went to Acts 15. But uh, let's see. Acts 21, 18, and the day following, and Paul was coming from, from, from the other lands, preaching, and, and he went back to Jerusalem to talk to the, to the council. So they had a believing council in Jerusalem which was hated by James, the Lord's brother, Yahweh's brother, all right? And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. Now watch this, now these are, these are believers, all of them are. When they had heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe. But basically right there in Jerusalem, there was thousands of Jews which believe. And they are all zealous of the law. See that? They were Jews which believe. And what else? They believe in what else? They were zealous. 
So when you see Christians talking about the law is done away with, you ask them about this. What about the Christians that believe, the Jews that believe, and they were still je zealous of the law? What happened with them? The, the apostles didn't tell them the law was done away with it? All right. So you had to question them on this right here. What do you mean the law is done away with? Right here, they told Paul, when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews that, that there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. Verse 21. And they are all, they are informed of thee, that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they are not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. Which is, what is it, what is it? Therefore, so they ask him, they question him on this. Like, why are you teaching these people that the, the, the law is done away with to forsake Moses' law? What is, what is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together. So they're gonna to come together because they heard about Paul. For they will hear that thou art come. Verse 3, 23, do therefore this, that, that we say to thee, do therefore this that we say to thee, we have four men which have a vow on them, them take and purify thyself with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads and all they and all may know those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly. Here's the key to this word, to these to this context of scripture. But that, that thyself also walkest orderly. But he's saying if you keep the law. You walk in orderly. So basically, even keeping friends is on, is walking orderly and keep us the law. That thyself walk is orderly and keep us the law. Hold on just a moment. So, right here is a challenge for most Christians. Acts chapter 21 because the apostle Paul, uh, James, the Lord's brother, was telling Paul that if you're teaching these people, these Gentiles or these Christians, these, uh, these, these brothers in other lands that are believers to forsake Moses, you're wrong. That's what they're telling them. They say, here are some brothers that's, that's fulfilling their vow, going to be purified with them so that the people will know that what people, the Jews that were zealous of the law, they were believers. They may know that what they spoke what well, they heard about you or nothing, but that thou also walkest orderly and keepest the law. All right. So you can really burn up some people with this right here. As touching the Gentiles, which believe we have written and concluded, they observe no such thing save only that they save only that they keep themselves from things all the idols, from blood from strangled and from fornication. Then Paul took the men the next day, purified himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. All right. So right here is telling us that the law is still in effect, even to this day. Let me go back. So what was Paul talking about? Why serve the law? Let's go back here. Let's see Galatians 3.19. Wherefore then serve the law. It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promises were made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, barely righteousness should have been by the law. So basically, let's say I'm not going to go too far into that because a lot of what Paul is, seems to be saying seems to be saying what the people thought he was saying in, in, the, in the temple. That they heard he was teaching everybody to forsake Moses. Even to this day, when people read Paul, they think he's talking about forsake Moses, forsake the law. Now, Here's the case in the Melchizedek priesthood. Let's go back here to Numbers. This can be kind of confusing. 
And I think Yah did this on purpose. He made even Paul's writing very confusing. And Peter said that. Let's see, let's go back here to Numbers. Peter said that, that those which are unlearned and unstable rest to their own destruction. So basically, yeah, how I said it too? He's speaking parables. That those that are without may get into some trouble. And then you might say, why did you do that? Because if you would have spoke plainly to us, we would have not have been without when we got into trouble. All right. And here's the situation. The reason why they got into trouble, their hearts were not right. So when the sower went forth to sow seed, and he sowed it, he didn't sow it on good ground with those people. They were sown on stony ground, on dry ground, the birds came in there to seed and among the thorns and, and thistles, and they didn't produce good fruit. They didn't produce fruit, but only the fruit that produced fruit only the seed that produced fruit were the ones that were sown on a, in a heart that was good. And so he knew that the people's hearts weren't to receive the seed of the word of God. So he spoke in parables so that they could fall backwards and be broken. And hopefully they might be saved. Okay, so right here it says, speak unto the children of Israel, bid them that they make them friends the borders of their garments throughout their generations. So basically, he's still saying that the law and the fringes is in, is in effect. But if you got the Holy Ghost, all right, and the, the whole thing is so that you may not, you may look upon those fringes and remember to keep the commandments. But if you got the Holy Spirit, all right, if you got the Holy Spirit and you, you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, Basically, fringes is not going to, you don't need that. You got the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. All right. Let's go back up here. Let's, see. Let's go to John. John 16, 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth has come. He will guide you in all truth. He will guide you in all truth. All right. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak and he will show you things to come. So when you have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit would lead you into the way of truth. And what is truth? All right, let's go here real quick. Psalms. Remember, what is truth? That's the question. What is truth? What is truth? Watch this. Psalm 119, 142. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and thy law is what? The truth. So basically, if you got the Holy Ghost on you, you can feel the Holy Ghost. You don't need no friend just to look upon. You got the spirit, you got the inner witness inside of you, leading you and guiding you in which way you should go. All right. And this is what happened to me before I even knew that I was a Hebrew Israelite. And what I mean by knew before I was convinced where this was my understanding. Before then, I, I wasn't sure. I knew that we might be the Jews, there was a chance, but I was a believer, I was a Christian and was trying to break into the church, trying to not break in, not break into it, but to get into the church, to get into fellowship. But something was wrong. I knew something was wrong. The Holy Spirit let me know and never allowed me to really become a part of this church system, this pagan church system that we see today. All right. 
And the reason why he didn't allow me because I was filled with the spirit. Before I was filled with the spirit, I was not interested in church. I just didn't have any time or place for it. I had the other things in my mind. But I was interested in the Lord. I was interested in God. I'm trying to do the right thing and everything, but I didn't have the power to do all of those things until the Holy Spirit came up on me. And still, after that, I still kind of slipped off and done some wrong stuff. Okay. Why? Because I wasn't getting word. So I had the Holy Spirit, but I was getting the pagan Gentile doctrine, gospel. And uh, that we weren't the Israelites, for one thing. I knew something was wrong, too. I knew something was not right. And the Holy Spirit was letting me know. He was guiding me into all truth. But I still went astray trying to find it my own way, that rhyme. I went astray trying to find it my own way. way. All right. All right here it says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy Torah, that word for law right there is Torah in the Hebrew, is the truth. All right. Now, we got a lot of Hebrew Israelites that, uh, that, don't, that have never had that experience of infilling of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit come upon you with power. Got a lot of Hebrew Israelites that basically keep the law. All right. And when they keep the when you keep the law, you don't have the Holy Ghost, the infilling the power of the Holy Ghost. Right there, the, the law, because it's spiritual, has you. All right. Let's look at that scripture real quick. Because the law, even if you just don't have the Holy Ghost and you're keeping the law, it has you still. But I personally, when I want to just do that and just trust in keeping the law, I personally would not like that. I want the Holy Spirit because once you get the Holy Spirit, it never leaves you. Romans 7, 14 says this. Well, we know that the law is spiritual. See that? So even the law that was given because of transgression is spiritual. All right. So you see a lot of Hebrew Israelites that you can tell they haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit. But they, they are out on the street corners. They're teaching it, some good stuff. All right, and the, the spirit is with them, the Holy Spirit, which is spiritual, is with them because they keep in the law. They haven't been empowered by the Holy Ghost like the disciples or like other people have been, but they are still spiritual because they keep in the law. They got their fringes on, which is not bad. The only thing is they have not been filled with the Holy Ghost. And that, that's what happened to me. I was filled with the Holy Spirit. Many Hebrew Israelites, even though they are God, Yah's chosen people, uh, they haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean that they're not with Yah. That doesn't mean that they're not uh, on their way. But from what I know, in order to get to the kingdom, in order to be great in the kingdom, all right, in order to be great in the kingdom, you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You have to be baptized, washed. Let's see, let me go down here. And that's what Yahweh Shai told Nicodemus. I don't want to get too closely like a lot of these Christian pastors. They eat pork chops and preach in the morning, on Sunday morning. But right here, Yahweh Shai told Nicodemus, Really, really, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. All right, he cannot see unless he's born again. And notice he says, see, read 1492. Let's go there real quick. See, I do, I do, I do. That's how you say that, 1492. That, that sounds like a year that they started taking us into slavery over there or something would happen. Christopher Columbus discovered America or something. 
So to perceive, I would say, to be aware, to be whole. So hold on, this internet is kind of kind of a uh, shaky right, right now. So you kind of you you go out, or come back in. All right, saying really, I say unto you, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said unto him, How can man be born? As old, can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Barely I'd say unto thee, except the man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So I would rather, I would rather, and that word for enter is 15 to 25, right? But we saw that see means to perceive, to see, just to behold. I serve comma he, I serve comma he, 15 to 25, or enter. Literally means to enter, literally or figuratively, to arise, come in, and to enter in, to go in. So you can see, if you're born again, you can see the kingdom. But if you're born of the water, of water and of the spirit, and here's the key right here, born of the spirit. It says water right here. And I would take this for right now as water baptism in Yahweh's name. And I would take this as the baptism of the Holy Spirit right here. One of the water and the spirit. What happens is now this new this new way that Yahweh Shai instituted with his flesh, he calls you to enter into the kingdom of God. And this is the best thing that could ever happen to you right here. Best thing that can happen to you is not being born again. All right, the best thing that can happen to you is the kingdom of God entering into the kingdom. That's it. That's the that's the ace boom coon. That's the crown right there. The crown of your existence is the kingdom of God. If you don't get the kingdom, at least you can have eternal life. All right. And that would be the that would be plan B to, to have eternal life. You just won't have a ruler, you won't be a ruler of God on the earth in Yah's kingdom. Is that a biggie? Oh yeah. Oh yes. Because he mentions many people weeping and gnashing the teeth because they didn't get the kingdom. They have eternal life. You know, they were around, they were around the place. And then they said, let's see, let's go over here. This is what most of them said that had eternal life, but didn't get the kingdom, let's see. Matthew 7. Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. See that? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, in other words, not everyone that knows me as Lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So what is the will of Yahweh Shai's Father which is in heaven? It's keeping the Torah, right? Let me highlight this right here. All right, but he that doeth the will of my father, which is in heaven. And how we're gonna know this, it's gonna show it's gonna show itself in a second to you where why it's keeping the keeping the law. Verse 22: Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? That sounds like many churches today prophesying, which is preaching, you know, dancing on stage, preaching, singing. All right, that doesn't mean anything as far as the kingdom. Have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils? And that's good to cast out devils in your house his name. You deliver people from oppression of the devil. And in thy name done many wonderful works. Many people, you know, you send in money to Africa to feed the hungry children. Many wonderful things. And then he said, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So what's going on right here? Did these people lose their salvation? All right, let me put it this way. Those that knew Yahweh Shai as Lord, knew him as Savior, that were born again, all right? Those that were born again and did all of those things because literally 
you have to be born again to do this, to prophesy in his name, cast out devils, and to do many wonderful works. That's a born again person. But he said, I was professing and I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. The key to this is the word iniquity. All right, the key is the word iniquity. What were they doing? It said they worked iniquity. So what is working iniquity? Anamia, anamia, anamia. I should have known how to say that word, anamia. It means legality, illegality. That is violation of the law, see that? But that's why he said, unless they do the will of his father in heaven. So he's telling us what the will of the father in heaven is, is to not violate the law. Violating the law, let me highlight this, violate the law leads to wickedness. This is what it's called in the scriptures. So if you're a violator of the law, it's called wickedness. And that's called also iniquity. And that's what it says right here. You work over iniquity, transgression. All right. So the whole point is, is that in order to not become a work of iniquity, you might need that power of the Holy Ghost. And that's what the power of the Holy Ghost is. It helps you to overcome your sinful fleshly tendency. All, right. All of us have that. Even the ones that have the Holy Ghost have to learn how to walk in the Holy Spirit so that they won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let's see, where's that scripture at? Let's see, go down here. We got on this topic from what uh, Jerome was talking about a little earlier. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will use something like that to tell you, hey, this is what you're going to teach on. All right. You might, a man may plan his way, but it's Yahweh that directs his steps. All right. Always remember that. You might plan your own way, but Yahweh don't, don't forsake him for your own way. What you think, Yah, is leading you to do. Yah, Yah says, no, I got something else for you. And then listen to the spirit. Galatians 5, 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit. See that? Walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So when you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when you learn how to walk in it, guess what happens? You won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Because it's, all of us have experienced how tough it is to not sin. All right, all of us have experienced that. But even the ones that have the baptism of the Holy Spirit have trouble sometimes walking in the spirit and not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. All right, so it goes to show you how powerful the flesh, the pull of the flesh is. All right. Let's see here. Romans 8. Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, and are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. See that? So the ones that are led by the Holy Spirit, these are the sons of God. Now, what happened to me, I learned I was a Hebrew Israelite way before all of this happened. All right. Within the last 10 years since I've known Jerron, there's been a there's been a great awakening. All right. But I was a Hebrew Israelite in 1990. I was born again and filled with the Holy Spirit in 1984. And it was a tough road for me because there was no internet, there was nothing, there was no churches talking about who we were and all of that. And I just knew because I had the I had the Holy Spirit. I just knew something was not right. And I was, I was uh I was, uh, how can I put it? I was leery of the church system. Now, I had reason to be because my father, I'm not saying my father was a bad man. My father was an evangelist in the church. He was very powerful. He's one that let me know about this Holy Spirit where I got it eventually. My mother and father had the Holy Spirit. And they got divorced when I was about 12 years old. So it goes to show you that, the, so you can have the Holy Spirit powerfully and still 
transgress. But if you got the Holy Spirit, you got to, if you learn how to walk in it, learn what to do, it's going to lead you into all truth. And that's how I come to find out I was a Hebrew Israelite. Way before all of this Hebrew Israelite chism came to pass, I already knew I was a Levite. Before I saw a 12 tribes chart about who's who. Why? Because Yahweh told me. I asked him, he said, what am I, you know, what tribe about my father? He told me I was an Israelite. He said, Levi. And then I asked him, I said, what great person in the scriptures am I related to, am I descended from? Because all of us probably are connected to some great prophet, some person in the Bible. And he told me Moses, that I was a direct descendant of Moses. That I was a Levite and descended out from Moses. So therefore, my name is Malak Ba'amasha. Malak means king, and I, my name Malak is king because my last name in captivity means royalty, king. My captive name means king, or royalty. My last name, that's what it means. Uh, so Malak, son of Moses. Royalty, son of Moses. And that's how I got it from Yahweh. You know, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, many are led by the law. Now, if they're walking by that law, and the law is all that they can do, is, is what they want to do, you know, that's a way of being led by the Spirit of God, right? because you're keeping the law. Because the spirit of God, the law is spiritual, like we just read, right? Let me go back here. The law is spiritual. Yeah, Romans 7, 14, for we know that the law is spiritual. See? So if you don't have the Holy Spirit, another way of trying or excuse me if you haven't been filled with the holy spirit let's put it that way if you're born again you do have some part of the holy spirit but if you have not been filled with the holy spirit you're overflowing the law is spiritual all right i like this whole thing law is spiritual so when you see a lot of hebrews like on the street corner talking about trying to get their brothers to keep the law that's spiritual not all of us is called to do that, all right? Not all of us is called to do that, all right? Uh, there were schools of the prophets around at the time of Elijah, all right? And then, like what is called camps today. At the time of Elijah the prophet, they were what you would call camps. They call them schools of the prophets, all right? Kind of like it is today. We got a lot of brothers that Assemble together to keep the law together, to teach together. Let me see if I can find this real quick. They assemble together and there's nothing wrong with it. Because remember the law is spiritual. And this is what Elijah was around. But he, I don't think, it don't say that he was a part of the school of the prophets. Let's see. Schools, let's try that. So what you see on the street corners with our brothers, that the Hebrew Israelites have been that's been going on for hundreds, thousands of years, and we're returning to it. This is schools of the prophecy. Hmm. Let's see. Let's see if I can find this real quick. Hold on, just a moment, please. Be patient with me. Let's see, Second Kings. Let's try First Kings eighteen.
I don't know how to find this, but I'm looking through all of this. Sons of the prophets, that's not schools of the prophets, the sons of the prophets. And Elijah said unto him to Elisha, Terry, I pray thee here, for Yahweh sent me unto, sent me to Jordan. He said, as Yahweh liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood at the view afar off. And they kept telling Elisha, that you know that the Lord is going to take your master from your head today? I mean, basically, he was going to take him. So the sons of the prophets knew what was going on. But this kind of similar these sons of the prophets are similar to the ones that are in these camps, except these sons of the prophets knew the will of Yahweh. It was very powerful. Uh, it's going to be something else. We're, we're headed. We're headed to this very thing today, whereby these people that you see on the street corners are not only going to be just teaching the law, they're going to have power. All right. Why? Because Yahweh, this very ones that are on the on the street corner teaching the law, Yah is going to fill them all with the Holy Spirit at the end. I can show it to you right here in the book of Joel. Now that was an infilling, a powerful infilling of the Holy Spirit at the time of uh, Peter and Paul and all of them. And it shall come to pass, Joel 2, 28, it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. So this is what's going to happen for these Hebrew Israelites on the street. So it's going to be more than just preaching and teaching about returning to the law. They're going to eventually get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Want to know why I say that? I'm going through some scriptures right now with you, so be patient. Right. 
Acts chapter 5, verse 32. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so also the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him. So basically right here is saying in Acts 5, 32, that God gives the Holy Ghost to them that obey him. What is obeying? Keeping the law. So that's another way of getting the Holy Ghost is to be keeping the law. So when Yah says, okay, now it's the time for me to pour out the Holy Ghost upon the whole house of Israel again, like I did at first, you'd be one of those getting the Holy Ghost poured out on. All right? Because I seriously believe that many of these, if not all, of the Hebrew Israelites that call themselves Hebrew Israelites, that are on the street corners preaching and keeping the law and the commandments as best as they can, there's no doubt for me that these are the people that's going to get this latter-day Holy Ghost. All right? They're going to get the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the latter-day manifestation. All right. He gives the Holy Ghost to them that obey him. All right. And that means the law. Remember, he said, not everyone that said unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom. But those that do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, that means they obey him by keeping the law. All right. Now, I didn't know all of that at first. At first, I was just a Christian. But what I started doing, I started seeking Yah to fill me with the Holy Ghost. So I heard about it from my father and mother, because they both were part of the church, you know, the church that believed in this, that infilling of the Holy Ghost. They both had had it themselves. There's a lot of miracles that happened in my father's ministry. And when I got the Holy Ghost, that's what it was like, a miracle. The Holy Ghost was like a miracle taking place right there in front of your face. All right. And the Holy Ghost empowers you. Now, now, I believe that this latter day manifestation of the Holy Ghost is going to happen because of this person right here. And this is what we've been teaching on a whole lot. And Yah has led me to teach about who he really is, what's going to happen. All right. And one of the things I used to teach, and I, you know, I repent of it, and I didn't know any better. I thought I was right. I thought I was correct on it. But many people believe that. That Yahweh Shai is, guess who? God or the Most High. Yahweh Shai is not God, not the Most High. Uh, he's the Son of God, and He is the express image the express image of the Father. Let's look at this real quick. This is one of the most important things you're gonna learn in the Bible, if not the most important. Because the reason why I say it's the most important, because the, the, the greatest commandment that there is about loving Yahweh Allah with all your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. Hebrews 1 3 says, let me click on it real quick. Who being the brightness of his glory, talking about Yahweh Shah, brightness of whose glory? Brightness of whose, whose, whose glory is Yahweh Shah the brightness of? God, he's the brightness of God's glory. God who has sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has a, he appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. So what is Yahweh Shai? He's the brightness of the glory of God, and the express image the express image of his person all right 
So Yahweh is the brightness of God, the glory, the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. So what's going on here? All right. That means that the one that we know of is Jesus Christ. All right. It's just like his father. He's like a, a vessel, the greatest vessel, a brightness whereby when Yahweh inhabits this vessel, everything is really Yahweh. All right. So you're, you're going to see only Yahweh when you see Yahweh shine. The next time, you're going to only see Yahweh. This is important to notice. It's the most important commandment. Here O Israel, Yahweh Allah is one, is one. Yahweh, and thou shalt love Yahweh thy Allah with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and thy neighbor is thyself. All right. Yahweh I said the second commandment is loving thy neighbor as thyself, which is like unto it. All right. But right here is express, express image. Let's look at that 5481. Express image character that means uh, Yahweh Shai acts just like this person this God that means when this God inhabits Yahweh Shai at the end Yahweh Shai is at home because Yahweh Shai is just like his father so there's basically Yahweh is going to be with the son again all right the express image that means when you see him you've seen the father and he says that in john chapter 14 after what's his name asked him show us the father and then suffice for us uh, philip show us the father and then to satisfy us he said have i not, have i not been so long time with you philip you yet thou has not known me he that has seen me has seen the father these are the same scriptures i used to use to say that jesus was god but now i'm using them in the in a better way where I should have used them from the very beginning. That Yahweh Shai is not saying that he is God himself. He's saying that if you see him, you will notice that he is the express image. That means when you see him, you see the father, what the father is like. So what's going to happen? The father is going to inhabit the body of Yahweh Shai, going to inhabit him. All right. Father's going to inhabit Yahweh Shai. And it says that in the very beginning, that this Yahweh Shai, this, in, this manifestation of Yahweh Shai, with the Father in him inhabiting him, is how he made the world. By whom, let me do this real quick. By whom, this is how he made the world. He made the world by this creature that he made before he made the world. That creature that he made was, would, later, would later be called his son. All right. Would later be called his son. But basically, Yah, who was the invisible God, inhabited this creature right here, his firstborn of all creation, is Yahweh inhabited him and created everything. So what we saw 2,000 years ago when this man showed up as a baby, we saw the physical part of him, all right? The physical part, the fleshly part of Yah. The weakest part of Yah, the weakest part of him was Yahweh Shah. I'm gonna show this to you real quick. First Corinthians one twenty five, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. So, what is the foolishness of God? Foolishness of God is Yahweh. Believe it or not, that's as, that's as foolish as he gets. 
and the weakness of God right here. See the other part of the verse of First Corinthians one twenty five. The weakness of God is stronger than this than than men. What is the weakness of God? Yeah, how was that? Because the weakness of God is stronger than men and the foolishness of God is, is wiser than men. Verse 24 says it like this, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Why? Because Christ is stronger than men and he's wiser than men, but that is the weakest part of God, Christ. So when we see Yahweh Shai 2000 years ago, we saw the weakness of God, we saw the foolishness of God which is wiser than men, which is stronger than men. All right. It's really something else because the more I study this about God and about the second coming, is that what we're gonna see when we see Yahweh Shai again, we're gonna see the, the fullness of the God here at bottom. All right. Let's go right here again. It's gonna be in the New Testament because it was not around in the Old Testament, that was a mystery. Colossians 2, 9. For in him, for in who? Yahweh for in him, it didn't say he is, it said in him. All right, let's look at the word in Greek, 1722 in the Greek. And that word is E-N, in. Uh, let's see, in, you know, in basically is what it means. For in him dwelleth all the fullness, all the fullness of the God here bodily. So basically, when Yahweh Shai, when Yahweh comes down here, he's going to inhabit Yahweh Shai fully, completely. All right. For fullness means repletion or completion. We read this last week. Uh, what fills the contents, supplement. Multitude, uh, what is filled. So basically, Yahweh Shai getting filled with the Holy Spirit, getting filled with the God here, is like us getting filled with the Holy Spirit. All right. So he will be filled with the God here bodily. But it's no biggie because when you study this, if he is the express image, that means the exact image of the Godhead, if he's the exact image of the Father, as Hebrews said, then Yahweh Shai is at home. It's not like he's, he's gone, he's been done wrong. Yahweh Shai was created to fit Yahweh and his manifestation. His express manifestation is he was created to fit him perfectly. When Yah created Yahweh Shai, he says he's the beginning of the, the beginning of the creation of God. Let's see, let's find that. But before we find that right here, I want to expound on this. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the God here bodily. So basically when he told Philip, he that has seen me has seen the Father. From now on you've seen him and known him. That means when you see Yahweh, his expressions, everything about him, guess what? When they when they when they when people say, boy, that dude looks just like his father. Well, in Yahweh's case, he is basically like exactly like the father, exactly. All right, exactly. That means what Yahweh, what Yahweh did 2000 years ago in sending his son, he sent his physical part. He sent the physical part of him. All right, who is exactly like him. Right. And this son that we know as Yahweh Shai, Delights 
to do Yah's will. So he, he rejoices to be like his father. But in the end, he's going to really be happy because of the, the fullness of the God here bodily is going to be him. He's going to inhabit the fullness of the God here bodily. All right. So many people might listen and say, how, how can that be? Well, it's just like somebody that got clothes. Oh, my goodness. This is a heck of a thought. This is like somebody got clothes made specifically for him. The size and everything for his taste, his character that's going to illustrate his personality and everything. That's what Yahweh Shai is for the father. He's clothing. Oh my goodness. He's clothing. He's he's uh he's what the father's gonna clothe himself with and come down. You hear that? You see what I'm saying? Oh my goodness. So basically, Yahweh is clothing for the Father. He's exact, he's, a, he's got his exact measurements, taste, everything. Yahweh Yahweh is going to put him on, put him on himself. Uh, he's going to inhabit the body. And Yahweh is going to be happy. Let's go to another scripture real quick. This is really something else. <laughs> Let's see, Psalms 21. This is a Psalm of David to the chief musician. Whenever it is to the chief musician, that's to somebody that's in the future. And to be honest with you, I used to say this chief musician was the angel of Yahweh. Now, all of these things are, are really right on top. It's really right on target. This chief musician is, is the second in authority in the temple. The temple really in the future is Yahweh's throne. All right. Where's Yahweh going to be at in Jerusalem? In the millennial reign, he's going to be in the, in the temple. He's going to be in the temple down here, not up there. And he's still going to be up there, but there's going to be something about him down here. Who is that going to be? We're just talking about Yahweh Shai. Yahweh Shai, he's going to be inhabiting, filling up Yahweh Shai to the full. He's going to be in Yahweh Shai. Yahweh Shai and him is going to be in perfect obedience, a perfect unity. All right. But to the chief musician, a psalm of David, the king shall joy in thy strength, O Yahweh. So, what king is he talking about right here? All right. The king shall joy. In thy strength, O Yahweh, and in thy salvation. What's that word, salvation? Let's look at it. Hebrews 3, 4, 4, 4. In thy salvation, Yeshua. That's, that's what he's translated a lot of time for Yahweh Shai. Yeshua. And in thy Yahweh Shai, how greatly shall he rejoice. All right. And notice it said, in thy Yahweh Shai. For in him dwell of all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So this king is going to be in Yahweh Shai. Because it says, in Yahweh Shai, how greatly shall, shall he rejoice. So who is this king right here? It has to be Yahweh. The king shall joy in that strength of Yahweh. He's talking to Yahweh, but he's talking about Yahweh as king. The only way I can really put this together is this. That this king right here would be Yahweh manifested. Okay, and he would be walking by faith, even though Yahweh, you know, we know Yahweh is omnipresent, omniscient, and all of that. I think that's what omniscient means, omnipresent. We know he is omnipresent. So let's look at this like this. Can he also be a man that manifests down here, all right, for the purpose of sitting as king in Jerusalem? Now, it's hard to believe that Yahweh Shai himself, this Yeshua, this salvation by himself, can sit on the throne of David. And many might say, how could that be? Now, you've been around in the scriptures as long as I have. You would probably know what I'm going to go to. That there was a king named Jeconiah 
that was around before the captivity of Babylon, before Nebuchadnezzar took him into captivity. Where there's a scripture that says that let no man of his seed sit upon the throne of David and prosper, and that therefore from forever. And you look at Yahweh's genealogy, he's a descendant of Jeconiah. So can Yahweh sit upon the throne by himself? No. And prosper, he would not prosper upon that throne. All right. Some say, well, he died and rose again, so he's not he's not subject to that curse. All right. But it says from henceforth and forever. So yeah, that means Yahweh cannot sit up on the throne of David. But who this king right here that would be in Yeshua, right here in Yeshua. And by Yeshua, if you're your Shai, this king would have to be a different person that, that is in Yahweh Shai. His person would be different. This king right here, if he comes down and dwells as a regular human being, all right, could do it. Who would that king be? He would have to be Yahweh. But this is how he would have to do it. He would have to come down as a regular human being. That means subject to sin and all of that. He would be, this person right here would already have lived a righteous life as the lamb, all right? He'd already have to be the lamb, went up to heaven and sat on the right hand of this king in heaven. Why did he do that? Because when he comes down here to earth, He's going to be sitting. He's going to sit in this salvation. That means he's going to be this person right here. Not fully, but he's going to be that person. He's going to be Yeshua, which means salvation in English. He's going to be salvation. There's a scripture in the book of uh, Isaiah that says, I am the Lord, and besides me, there is no Savior. All right, so that's the reason why Israel is still looking to be saved at this moment. Why? Because this person, this king that, he, that David is talking about, who is the express, who Yahweh is the express image of, all right, has to do something. That's why the world's going on for 2,000 years with Yahweh is in heaven. Because the one that's up there on the throne, this king is going to come down here and be on the throne. All right? But when he comes down here and sits on the throne, he's going to be wearing salvation. Let me see if I can find that scripture. Put on salvation and see if that's what it is. He's going to be wearing salvation. Put on. Or clothe himself with salvation, I think it's a let's see if we can find it right here on this one. All right. Isaiah 59, 17. Let's see, let's try this. I'm gonna try the verse before to see what that says. Isaiah 59 and 15 are stuck there. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departed from evil make himself a prey. And Yahweh saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. And it says, you know, Yahweh saw it, and he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness is sustained him. Who is this talking about? I'm talking about Yahweh. Therefore, his arm brought salvation. That word salvation right there is Yasha which is a root word for Yeshua. Verse 17, for he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation, that helmet of Yeshua, and a helmet of Yeshua upon his head. He put on the garment of vengeance for clothing 
and was clad with zeal as cloak as a cloak with a cloak. All right. According to their deeds, according to he will repay fury to his adversary, recompense to his enemies, to the islands he will repay recompense. So it looks like this king is putting on some garments. All right. Right, they put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation and a bonus head, put on the garments of vengeance for clothing, and was clad with zeal of the cloak. So it looks like this king, which is Yahweh, is coming down here to do all of this. And we see this right here in the scriptures, but we never contemplate, like David said, about this king glorying in his salvation. Let's go back. Let's see. Let me try, try another one. You saw right there, he put on salvation. Uh, Uh, let's go back to Psalms. So we see the king shall joy in thy strength, O Yahweh, and thy salvation and thy Yeshua, how greatly shall he rejoice. Thou hast given him his heart's desire and has not withhold him the request of his lips. So it looks like the same king that is really Yahweh is going to do something like what Yahweh Shai did. He's going to be on the earth praying to what seems to be his own throne. He's gonna come down here like a regular man and he's gonna be, he's gonna be submitting himself like a regular man until he puts on your Habasha. God has given him his heart's desire that God has not, has not withholding the request of his lips, Selah. Adopt a venice him with blessings of goodness. Thou set us a crown of pure gold on his head. He has the life of thee and thou givest it to him and let the days forever and ever. So this king, this person that David is talking about, will not he will never die. So that can't be Yahweh Shai. Some would say, well, that is Yahweh Shai because Yahweh Shai lives forever and ever. He has multiple days, but he died. Right here, this king says he has this person says he has the life of, of him, and he gives it to him, let the days forever and ever. That means he's going to be in a situation where he had to ask God or ask the throne of heaven for life forever. And it was given to him. So this God that is omniscient and everywhere at the same time will also be in one place at, at, at a time, at the same time. He would be inhabiting the body, the manifestation of Yeshua, Yahweh. Why he's everywhere at the same time. But he will be he will be doing this by faith, so he will have to be like a regular man. Right here, verse five. His glory is great in thy salvation and thy Yeshua. His glory is great in thy Yeshua. Honor and majesty have thou laid upon him. Verse six, for thou has made him most blessed forever. Thou has made him exceedingly glad with thy kindness. But the king trusted in Yahweh, mercy of the most high, he shall not be moved. So, so when you look at this, it's hard to believe that, that Yahweh would do something like this. And we just saw it right there that he came down his own self. He saw that there was no man. He came down his own self. All right. His arm bought uh, something to him, we just read. And he put on Yeshua, the helmet of Yeshua. So it looks like what the nation is going to be seeing when they see Yahweh Shai again is really Yahweh himself. So let's go there. This revelation. I'm going to be cutting this short. Yeah, I will. Yeah, I want me to continue to talk on this. I will. Revelation 19 speaks about a war that's going on. Revelation 19, 11, and I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. All right. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. 
Many people will say, well, John chapter one, that's Jesus. Well, let's read it a little bit more. And the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed, clothed and fine linen, clean and white and clean. And out of his mouth go up a sharp sword that with it he shall smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he shall eat it. And he treaded the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. All right. But basically, whoever this person is, has the wrath of Almighty God. Is that Yahweh Shai? Remember, Yahweh Shai said he was not Almighty God. But this person would have the wrath of Almighty God. He has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written. Notice it ain't say you notice it ain't say it's Yahweh Shai, right? And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All right, it ain't saying this is Yahweh Shai. So what's going on? Well, it looks like Yahweh himself is coming down. He's coming down wearing the vesture of Yahweh Shai himself. Yahweh is coming down wearing the vesture of Yahweh Shai. So that's going to be a different type of personality. That's the reason why when you look in the Old Testament, you notice that Yahweh, with the manifestations of Yahweh, seem to be a little different in personality than the manifestation of Yahweh Shai. All right. Let's see, let's go to Genesis chapter, let's see, let's try 18. And Yahweh appeared unto him in the plains of memory, talking about Abraham. And he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them in the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. And said, My Lord, that word might be Adonai. Let's see, 1 Hebrew 136. But he's talking singularly to somebody. 136, Adonai. And he said, my Adonai, or Adonai, if now I have found faith in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray ye, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves on the tree. So that was one particular individual that he's speaking to, but it's two, there's three men all together. All right? And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort your hearts, so after that you may pass on, but therefore you come to your servant. And so do as thou hast, hast said. But we know the whole story. He went in there and he told it, Sarah to make some stuff. They made this stuff and got the meal together and he sat by them while they was eating, while they ate. And here's another thing too. Watch this. This one that, yeah, that Abraham speaking to him called Adonai, that we just mentioned a little bit ago, he's gonna, you're going to see is Yahweh. He says, where is Sarah thy wife? All right. Sarah laughed, talking about, well, how in the world we're going to have children? We both are old. Yahweh said unto Abraham, with what did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I have a bear a child? To move. Now, look at this. This ain't, this ain't Yahweh Shai. That ain't Yahweh Shai right there. The Lord said unto Abraham, with what did Sarah laugh? That's not Yahweh Shai talking. That's Yahweh. That's the Father. Is anything too hard for Yahweh? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the set time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she said, but she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. So there's a little difference in personality. Whereby Yahweh Shai is a little, is a little humble, humble. Whereby the father, this Yahweh, doesn't hold his tongue any in any shape, form, or fashion. And the men rose up and danced and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And Yahweh said, Shall I hide from Abraham that which I do? Seeing that Abraham will surely become a great nation, a mighty a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. They shall keep the way of Yahweh to do justice and judgment, 
that Yahweh may bring upon Abraham that which he's spoken of him. Yahweh said, because the cry of Sodom is great, because, and because their sin is very grievous, I will, do now, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together for the cry of it, which has come unto me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before Yahweh. And Abraham drew near and, and said, Wilt thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou destroy not, without destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? Be that far from thee to do after this manner and slay the righteous with the wicked. And that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee shall not the judge of all the earth do right. So who is the judge of all the earth? Was it Yahweh Shai? And now when I believed that Yahweh Shai was Yahweh, I thought of him being the judge of all the earth. But in actuality, we see Yahweh is the judge of the earth. Yahweh is the judge of all the earth. Yahweh said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their, for their sake. Abraham answered again. So Abraham pushes the button again. There'd be 40 or something like that. Then he goes down to 30, 20, 10. All right. But there's a different personality in this one that we see as Yahweh and the one that we see as Yahweh Shai. And uh, let me see, let's go back to a place over here. Where we can see who is Yahweh Shai praying to. Let's see. Here. John chapter 17, verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, thou art come, glorify thy son, and thy son also shall glorify thee. But he's calling whoever this is, and we know that it's Yahweh. He's calling him Father. This Father right here has to be the Almighty God. All right. Now, this is why I was wrong at in the past, and I repent of it. But I was wrong, not trying to be wrong, not trying to take glory away from the Father, to give it to somebody else, but because that's what seemed to be true. He calls him father. Watch this. Verse three. This is eternal life that they may know thee. Notice that he said that they may know thee. Who is the thee right here? That's his father. That's the one that's up in heaven on the throne. This is eternal life that they may know thee. The only, that word right there, it says only true God. So who is the only true God? Yahweh Shai's father. Not Yahweh. This is the, this is eternal life that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. All right. And Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And it didn't call Jesus Christ the only true God. It called the Father that he's talking to the only true God. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. So the Father is the one that gave Yahweh Shai the work to do that he done. And he glorified the Father in heaven with the work he did. And now, o Father, glorify thou me with thine own self. Look at this. Look at this. You ready for this? Little name's filling over there. All right. And now, Father, glorify thy me with thine own self. Look at this. Look at this. Let me read that again. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self. And we, many, I know all of us have read this and wondered, what is he talking about with thine own self? Let me highlight this again. And now, O, o Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So remember, Yahweh Shai is the beginning. He called himself the beginning of the creation of God. That means when 
Yeah, I started creating everything he created, Yeah, how should I first? All right, so how's he gonna glorify him with his own self? Oh, what we just talking about. That or the father is gonna put on Yahweh Shai. He already had done this to create everything. Let me read that again. Now, O oh Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Let's go there. I'm gonna show this to you. That he calls himself the beginning of creation. Hold on, give me a second or two. How do you spell beginning? Is that two ends? Yeah, okay. Let's see if that's it. That's four hits. Revelation 3 14. And unto the angel of the church of the lay of the sins write, these things said the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. All right, so in order for him to call himself at this moment, the great beginning of the creation of God. This person that is, shows up in Revelation chapter one has to be, has to have Yahweh in him, the fullness of, him, because that's what created the heavens and the earth. All right, let me highlight this real quick. For well, in him dwells all the fullness of the God here bodily. So he says he's the beginning of the creation of God. That means he right here. We see him in Revelation chapter one with uh, feet that look like polished brass that burn in the furnace and eyes like a flame of fire and his hair like real wool, white as snow. Basically, that's the father inhabiting the son. All right. That's what's going on right there. And he's called the beginning of the creation of God. So what was we at? Let's go back here again. He said, now father glorify me. Let's go back there again. Let's see John chapter 17. Verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So we're right on, we're right on the point. See, this is not far fetched. How's he gonna glorify the son with his own self? With his own self. How's he gonna do that? He's gonna inhabit the body of Yahweh Shai, the glorified body. How's he gonna do that? Well, he's himself. What makes what, what seems that in order for that to happen, excuse me, the father would have to manifest himself as a regular human being. That means somebody that might have it even done sin. That might have even messed up. Someone that doesn't know, excuse me, that doesn't even know who he is when he's manifesting. He has a few hints, a few little flags going up about who he is, but it's a matter of faith. All right, he has to come down here really had to have the, the faith like nobody else has ever had. Okay. He is Yahweh. That would be very tough for somebody, for somebody that's really sincere about their faith in God. It could not be just anybody that do this either because you'd be blaspheming the Holy Spirit. But if Yah comes down here and takes away his own identity, manifests himself as a regular human being for this purpose right here, it would be great faith to, for himself to recognize who he really is. And he really is Yahweh. So he would have to do this by faith, not by sight. He would have to come around to believe in that he is Yahweh himself. 
Now, obviously, if he's in the world, if he's in the world, his person is in the world, all right? And he's living, he's walking by faith. He comes around to realizing who he is, all right? All of that would be by faith. Eventually, he would overcome and his reward would be the body, would be the body of Yahweh Shabbashu. And that's what Yahweh Shai is waiting on too. Now, Father, and now, Father, glorify that means of thine own self with the glory I had with thee before the world was. Now, Yahweh Shai often spoke, he, he spoke about it, that no one knows the day nor the hour of the second coming the angels, nor him. He doesn't even know. Why? Because what he's going to do in the latter day in manifesting himself down here is going to be something that's that's uh, only the highest to know. It's going to be a, a what you would call reality lifestyle, reality television, whatever. It's going to be something like that. Even the son himself don't know. Because all of this is going to be spontaneous. And it's spontaneous. And only the father who is most high can oversee all of this. So the son doesn't even know. That right there is another clue that this father comes down here as a regular human being. And that the heavens, when he does come, the heavens, the angels and all of that, I'm watching. Let's go here real quick. They're watching what's going on on earth. Why? Because no one knows how this thing is going to finish them. Revelation chapter 17, we'll go here every now and then to prove these points. We see the 144,000 sealed in Revelation 7. 144,000 in a great multitude. All right, they stood before the throne, clothed. They stood before the throne and before the Lamb. Now, watch this. They stood, a great multitude stood before the throne. Notice it said before the throne. You notice it didn't say they stood before the one that sits on the throne, but they stood before the throne. Now, who, what's going on with the throne? Isn't there somebody sitting on the throne? But they're standing before the throne and before the Lamb. The lamb is personalized, all right? The lamb is personalized. We know who that lamb is. That lamb is Yahweh Shai, all right? But the throne is not a person. Let's go there real quick. Highlight throne. Throne is not a person. I can be long-winded, y'all. Some of these are really worth it. Because I, I sense the, the spirit telling me to continue on on this topic. Throne is not a person. So why are they standing before the throne? Could it be that the one that sits on the throne is not there, but the lamb is right beside the throne? Where is this man that sits on the throne at? He's on the earth. But he's got a, it's a multitude of people and angels watching. Am I on the earth? See, it sounds far fetched a little bit, even to me. But this is the only way, and I put two and two together, this is the only way that this could happen. Where we see they stood before the throne and not before the one that sat on the throne. And before the lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in the hand. Now, watch this. And cry with a loud voice, salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb. Now they standing before the throne, but they're saying salvation to our God that was sitteth on the throne. So it's not basically saying something that, that covers the whole gamut, just saying the throne. But they're talking about salvation. They're wishing salvation. It's kind of like saying long live the king. Okay? But they're saying salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and also unto the Lamb, unto the Lamb. So where's the one that sits upon the throne? Now they stood before the throne, but where is he that sitteth 
upon the throne. Where is he at? If they stand before the throne and before the Lamb, where is the one that sitteth on the throne? He has to be on the earth at this time that we're talking about right here in Revelation chapter 7. And why is they saying salvation to him? We read that sometimes as just regular jargon. But why does the one, this God, that sit upon the throne need salvation? See? So what I say is that this God that sit upon the throne comes down so he can go back up and get the body of Yahweh Shai. So this is for Yahweh Shai too, so he comes down. And remember, your house I prayed. Let's go back up here. He prayed. Let's see. John chapter 17, verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thy me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Has that happened yet? Obviously not. So he's praying that that would happen. He's saying, oh, and now, O Father, I remember he does not know the day of the second coming, only the Father. So he's praying from the position of not knowing when these things are gonna happen. He's saying, and now, that means the sun has been up in heaven 2000 years, waiting on this to happen right here, this scripture. That, that the Father would glorify Yahweh Shai with his own self. That means the Father would put on Yahweh Shai and be the fullness of the Godhead in him bodily. That's what he wants. This is how Yah created everything. So this is what Yahweh Shai is comfortable with. He's comfortable with his Father person inside him, as him. That's glory for him. Glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee for the world was. All right. I hope y'all seeing this. Let's go back to Revelation chapter seven. Hope y'all seeing this. You see something over there? It says, "Now, Father, glorify thy name with thy own self, with the glory which I had with thee." That word "with" means beside. Beside me, yeah. And that's, on. that's another indication. Let me go back there. That he was with him. Let's see here. Look at that word with. So I probably got the same in audience. And now, oh, Father, glorify thy me with. Let's look at the word with. With thine own self, with the glory. Let's look at the word with 3844. Para, properly near, that is from beside. Near, from beside, vicinity or at or in the vicinity. Now remember, he's talking about his person. His person is with or beside or in vicinity. Uh, let's see. Among, at, before. Yeah, it's really something else. Well, if I didn't meet with thine own self, with the glory I had with thee before the world was. Glory and beside. The glory I had, okay, what was that at? With, that word with, that word is beside. With the glory which I had with thee. You talking about with? Mm -hmm. The word with. Yeah, 3844, right? Mm -hmm. Does yours say uh, beside, beside and the vicinity of? Yeah. So if you think about that, he's sitting on the right hand. Right. He's sitting on the right hand, I'm going to let you know what he is to that he's what? That he is God. Right. That's yeah. Like right there. And he's using the body 
his own your house has body for a certain purpose. Right. And that's the position the house I had with the body. Let's go back here. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Let's see, let's go back here, Revelation. So they're standing before the throne. So that means that they're watching the heavens will be watching him. They stood before the lamb. They stood before the throne and before the lamb, verse nine says, and cry with a loud voice, salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and not to the lamb. So where is he, if they're standing before the throne, it didn't say he's standing before the one that sits on the throne and before the lamb. He just said the throne and before But the throne is not a person. And cry with a loud voice, salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne. So where's this God which sitteth upon the throne at this time? It didn't say he was sitting on the throne. Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped the God. They, they fell before the throne. It didn't say that they fell before the one that sitteth upon the throne. They stood before the throne and fell before the throne on their faces, saying, Amen, blessing, glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sit up upon the throne shall dwell among them. Look at that. So how's the one that sit up upon the throne gonna dwell among the people? So he has to have a trek down here as a human being. That means the one that created everything with the body of Yahweh would have a trek down here. He would come down. Would he come down like in power? No, he's going to come down as a regular human being at first. That means he's going to be like the when he came down, he saw Babylon when they were building the tower. They didn't, Babylon didn't notice it. Hey, there's Yahweh right there. He came down like a regular human being where he would probably, he wasn't probably born in, into the world. But he came down as a regular human being. Probably like the same person that, that Abraham saw when they ate the meal together with the two other angels. And he came down. So basically, in this situation, this Babylon that we're living in, this, this king, this great God, is coming down to see this city, this spiritual city called Babylon, Mystery Babylon. So he will be born into the world. All right. And he's going to dwell among the people. And he's going to do a walk of faith with his life. Uh, now in the book of Daniel, chapter seven, excuse, excuse me, chapter nine, when it talks about the, the coming, Daniel 9, 25, I think it is. Hold on just a moment. And the angel Gabriel is talking to Daniel. He says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression to make an, make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince should be seven weeks. Now right here it says seven weeks unto Messiah the Prince. All right. Will be seven weeks. That means jubilees. That means that's, this would be somewhere around 49 years altogether when you count it. From the time that the commandment went forth to be, uh, rebuild Jerusalem, to build Jerusalem, be seven weeks. And then it has a comma. You got to watch these commas in the scriptures, like Isaiah chapter, I think it's 61, where it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. There's a comma that, that comma, the separation of that comma. It's somewhere around 2,000 years, 2,000 years altogether. 
of the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score, comma, and three score and two weeks. All right, three score and two weeks is separated from seven weeks. Now I've heard many theologians put the three score and two weeks and the seven weeks together and come out with 69 weeks. But the reason why this angel is telling Daniel seven weeks and three score and two weeks is for a reason. He didn't say, oh, I forgot to add it. I should have added that. No, it's basically two different time periods. That's when I separated with a comma. The street should be built again in the wall in troublous time. And after three score, watch this. Did he say after 69 weeks? No, he said after three score and two weeks, but after that comma, but three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off. So who is this that was cut off? That has to be Yahweh Shah. But it mentions two different time periods. Well, Messiah the Prince, right here. And right here, the three score and two weeks doesn't call Messiah the Prince. This three score and two weeks of someone being cut off is just called Messiah. So who is this that was cut off? That was Yahweh. But he's called Messiah. He's not called Messiah the Prince. So we have to take those things in consideration. But who is the prince? The prince would have to be the one that sits on the throne. That we just read in Revelation. That's going to dwell among the people. Messiah the prince. Seven weeks, he would come after seven weeks of jubilee period. After the commandment went forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Build Jerusalem. This would have to be in the latter day. Because this one already happened. The three score and two weeks, Messiah being cut off. That was Yahweh Shah. And when you, when you count these years, three score and two weeks, like 430 something years, it's exactly this, the, the amount of years, somewhere around the exact time period from the time that, that, uh, that the king of uh, Babylon let the Israelites go back to rebuild their temple to the time Messiah died on the cross. That's around the same time thing. So, 430 some years after that commandment to restore and to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, Messiah, Yahweh was killed on the cross. So three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. And it say Messiah the Prince. Right here it says Messiah the Prince. Here. And that will be seven weeks, 49 years. So what it looks like here is that this Prince is the manifestation of Yahweh himself coming down to dwell among the people. And remember, he puts on the body of Yahweh. So what's going on right now? Yahweh, Yahweh apparently is, uh, let's see, hold on. Apparently is, is, is running things because According to Revelation chapter 7, there's no one sitting on the throne. They bow him before the throne. Apparently, he's spiritually on the throne, but he's not, his, it's, not it's not like he's manifestly there on the throne. All right, so Yahweh Shai has to be one running things in the world. Why? Because if, if the one that sits on the throne is on the earth, it's manifested in the earth, then he let his son run things while he's down here living by faith. While he's down here getting everything straight. First Corinthians chapter 15, 27, for he had put all things under his feet. But when he said if all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which he had put all things under him. Right there, there's another thing. When we look at it, like what we're looking at right now, it's manifest that he is accepted, which he had put all things under him. Who put all things under Yahweh Shai? The Father, right? Let's read that again. For he had put all things under his feet. But when he said, all things are put under him, it is manifested that he is accepted, which he had put all things under him. All right. So who's the one that's coming? Who's the one that's going to be accepted? It has to be the Father, Yahweh Himself. Be 
this one. All right. Verse 28, and when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him. All right there, there is, there is again, it's saying that the father put all things under Yahweh Shai's feet. Read that again, and when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the son also be subject unto him, which did put all things unto him. So the son is going to be subject unto the father. So that's, that's another word saying that the son is not the father, he's not God. The son also himself should be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God, that God may be all in all. That God may be all in all. Let's go back up here, First Corinthians 15, 24. Then come at the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. So that means Yahweh is reigning right now in the heavens. But in the end, he's going to deliver up the kingdom back to God. Where's the one sitting on the throne right then? See that? The one that sits on the throne can't be sitting on the throne at the moment. Because the son has got the kingdom. He's going to deliver everything. When he's done, in the end, he's going to deliver up the kingdom to God. Even the father. Letting you know that this God is the same God as the father that Yahweh Shai was talking to in his prayers. The father. When he had put up, put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he had put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that should be destroyed is death. So why does this man in, in, in David's Psalm, Psalm 21, ask the life of thee, not gives it to him, long life even forever and ever? That means that this man is not going to die. That means this is where death is defeated. For he must reign till he had put all enemies under his feet. Verse 26, the last enemy shall be, that shall be destroyed is, guess what? Death. So how would that happen? That the one that comes down off the throne, comes down here as a human being, is going to defeat death too. The one that we call the Father, God the Father, is going to defeat death as a regular human being. So part of the, I was looking at some people Israelites today on the street corner. And I had to, it came to me though, the reason why these brothers out on the street corner, all of a sudden these things are going on is because this man has to be a nerd. The father has to be a nerd. The one that Yahweh Shai prayed to has to be a nerd. All right. And these Hebrew Israelites are sensing his presence. And he, they kind of show what he's like a little bit. The one that's called the father. That it's the father, God and father the Lord Jesus Christ. That he's kind of like those Hebrew Israelites. All right. But apparently this, this is how death is defeated. How is it defeated? By faith. And it takes the one that sits on the throne to do it. Now Yahweh Shai was let go of death. But you notice that he's not back in the earth yet at the moment physically. So death has not been put up under his feet yet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So that means death has not been put up under him. How is it going to be put up under him? It has to be put up on the, under the one that's going to inhabit the body of your house. Right? Because your house is, is, is going to, your is going to inhabit this body. So in order for him to inhabit this body, he has to come down here and defeat death himself but with the with the sacrifice of his lamb his son that's why the lamb is standing before the throne or next to the throne because the one that's on the throne is coming down and he's going to have basically the tendency to die like anybody else that's why you see in revelation 7 the great multitude says salvation to our god that sit up upon the throne and also unto the lamb Salvation. So why does the one that sits on the throne need salvation? So he basically put himself in that position to come down here, and I'm going to say it again before I let you go, to come down here 
and take away his own thoughts about who he is. He'd be living like a regular human being, but he can't be a regular human being. So he'd be fitting in with everybody, you know, just like any other, any other human being. And do you think he would know who he is? Will he eventually find out? Oh, yeah. He eventually find out who he is. And death has got to go. Death has got to go. So then shall all things be subdued unto him. When all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him to put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So all things are not subdued unto him. But it has to be that the Father is down here, and he has to do a particular thing and overcome death. So it makes sense. Then so the son also himself be subject. How is the son going to be subject to him to put all things under him? Because the father is going to inhabit the son. And it's just like, you know, the person walking with their body. You get up in the morning, it's you that tells that body to get up. So the son is going to be that body that obeys the spirit. That means he's physically going to be the son. But spiritually, he's going to be the father. So there's going to be a perfect harmony between the father and the son. The father's controlling the body. The son is the body. Who's in the body? His saints. Who's in the body of Yahweh Shah? His saints. So it's really something else. I'm, I'm sitting up here marveling my own self at all of this. All right? It's really something else. But I do believe that's what's going on, y'all. That we're right there at that time. If the Father is in there, all right. I'm gonna go back here and one more verse, then I'm gonna let y'all go. I'm long-winded. I admit that. But I hope that this is something that most people are not talking about. Genesis 3. When Adam sinned, Yahweh said something. How Allah Hayam says something that should make you think. If you know the scriptures, a lot of things are like the scripture says, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. God concealed all of this, but it's the honor of kings to search it out. Ah, I get that sent a chill of my, of my spine. But anyway, Yahweh Allah Hayam. Genesis 3.22, and Yahweh Allah Hayim said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life, and he can live forever. What he's literally saying there, that the man has become like one of, one of them that's up in the heavens. So we see the father, we see the son right beside the throne. Which one is the, which one is the man became like? to know good and evil. That had to be the one sitting on the throne because we know Yahweh Shai did not sin. So what's gonna happen is Yahweh Allah, I am this person right here, who's called the Lord God in the King James Version. This person right here is gonna come down and know good and evil. And Adam was like him. Adam is like the Lord God. All right. And said, Behold, a man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand. So, what's going to happen is, Lord God, though he knows good and evil, will eat of the tree of life. All right. Right here it says, And now, lest he put forth his hand and take up also the tree of life and the eat and live forever. So, this Lord God, even though he has sinned, he probably done wrong as a human being not knowing who he is and all of that. Um, we eat of the tree of life and live forever. Yeah. That's what is best. You see, it's right there. What's going to happen? This Lord God is going to come down 
no good and evil. All right, he of the tree of life on this earth. Let's read that again. The Lord God said, behold, a man has become as one of us. So it's letting you know that there's something going on with a plurality up there. It's come as one of us to know good and evil. We know Yahweh Shai did not know good and evil. He was perfect. He was a perfect sacrifice, the lamb. So that would have to be the one that sits on the throne. That would know good and evil. Let's read that again. Behold, a man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, let's see for, for now he would definitely be like the Lord God, knowing good and evil. And he would live forever if he eat of that tree of life. So they, what did they do? Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubim. And the flaming sword was turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So he was not going to allow that man to eat from the tree of life and live like that uh, forever. That would be the Lord God's thing. Only the Lord God would eat like that to know good and evil and eat from the tree of life and live forever. Only this person right here, Genesis 3, 23, would eat from the tree of life and live forever and knowing good and evil. He didn't allow Adam to do that. That's for him. So I'm amazed by it myself, just sitting up here looking at this. All right. I praise y'all, everybody. I'm going to let you go. And I'm going to marvel at it some more as I let you go. As I go sit down somewhere. But this is really something else. This is what's coming. So it's Yahweh Allah Hayim, the one that sits on the throne, is coming down here. He's going to dwell among the people. All right. And he's going to come down, and the heavens are going to be looking, be watching what he's doing, like a uh, stadium full of folks watching a, 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 a good movie because of how Allah Haim is going to be in there living like any other human being but can't be like any other human being because he's how Allah Haim he's the creator read Revelation chapter 4 where, where they fall down in the heavenly court in Revelation 4 and say thou has created all things they give him the glory first and we see in Revelation chapter 5 they're glorifying and honoring the Lamb but that Revelation 4 is talking about him. They bow down, glorifying and worshiping him that liveth forever, that created all things. And this is the one that's coming that's going to put everything right. Hallelujah. Amen. And we got the heathen boy that's worshiping the sun. They worship him. When they worship in the sun, they worship in the flesh. And it's righteous flesh, don't get me wrong. He lived righteously. He, he did not sin. You know, but to worship him, I think is a little is a little off. All right. We glorify him and we honor him, but we don't worship the Son like we worship the Lord God, Yahweh Allah. He's the one that should be worshipped. Like he said, this is eternal life that they may know thee, the only true God. In Jesus Christ from that sin. And he called his father the only true God. All right. Well, praise Yah. We pray that Yah bless everyone watching this video that he heals and restores and blesses, fills with the Holy Ghost. Has everybody ready that's listening to me at this moment? Has everybody ready for that great day? By Shani Hawashah Mashiach. Amen.